been asked to talk about two topics. One, some of the pharmacologic characteristics of the integrase inhibitors, and then some of the new emerging options we have to actually administer uh, these drugs. Um, now, some of these pharmacologic characteristics have already been touched on uh, by the first uh, presentation, uh, Professor Murrieta, and Jonathan uh, has talked about some in his talk, so I'll try not to uh, repeat uh, too much information. So this slide, and by the way, all of these slides are going to be made available to you uh, on the web after the talk. So uh, if you don't get anything now, uh, you'll have a chance to have, uh, to have all of these slides. So a few comments about the pharmacokinetic characteristics. Really, in many ways, these drugs are very similar. Uh, as you uh, learned this morning already, they're all metabolized by the liver. In some cases, a few different pathways, but they're all metabolized uh, by the liver. They all have at least moderate uh, to maybe a little bit longer half-life. So eight, nine hours, the shortest uh, for Elvitegravir, Raltegravir, perhaps out to 17 hours for the newest integrase inhibitor, uh, Bictegravir. The effect of food uh, came up today already, talking uh, about ways to perhaps boost some of the concentrations of the integrase inhibitors. And the last line shows you the effect of food. So Dolutegravir uh, was discussed, and you can see when given with a high-fat meal, you can boost concentrations 50%. And we have used this same strategy in managing patients to say, take the drug with, uh, with food, because you get a, 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 a very consistent, pronounced uh, effect. Raltegravir is a drug, also can have a very pronounced effect uh, from taking with food. The challenge with that drug is it's not as consistent. Sometimes, and, and for reasons we don't really understand, for sometimes you get a very good boosting effect with food, and in some cases uh, you don't. Well, in addition to pharmacokinetic characteristics, what also is important, and Dr. Shapiro talked about this, are the pharmacodynamic characteristics. So I'm trying to show on this slide some of the parameters that you would look at. And I start off with the IC50. Now, pharmacologists uh, tend, but we're not always consistent, to use IC standing for an inhibitory concentration when we're referring to in vitro data, and EC standing for an effective concentration when we're referring to clinical, uh, it could be also animal data, but where you're now really studying the effect uh, in vivo. And in this case, for all of these values, I've corrected them for protein binding. As you saw on that previous slide, all of these integrase inhibitors are very protein uh, bound. Raltegravir is the lowest at around 80%, and the others are all 99% or more. And remember your pharmacologic theory that it's only the free unbound drug that has the ability to cross biologic membranes and therefore exert a pharmacologic effect. So all of these values in are protein binding corrected. And again, uh, Dr. Shapiro has talked about the concept of IQ, the inhibitory quotient. While it may not be used often clinically, uh, it is very, it's a very useful way to compare uh, these drugs. So if you look at IQ, where now I've defined it, and this is pretty conventional, as the trough concentration divided by the protein binding corrected IC95. Another way to think about IQ, it's how much you've got, so how much drug is in the body, versus how much you need, what is that IC95. Um, these drugs are really uh, very similar, but not quite. Bictegravir looks to have the highest IQ value at 16. Uh, Raltegravir seems to have the lowest IQ value uh, at 8. <clears throat> Um, how do integrase inhibitors then compare, for example, with protease inhibitors? So on this slide, I'm showing you the integrase inhibitors at the usual clinical dose that's given. I've selected just two of the protease inhibitors, abazanavir, ritonavir at 300, 100, or darunavir, ritonavir at 800, 100 once daily. Um, you can see what stands out is how high 
the IQ value for darunavir is, and whether that uh, goes along with uh, some of the high uh, threshold uh, for resistance that Dr. Shapiro was talking about, I think remains some of the mysteries of uh, how these drugs work, what really are the causes of the emergence of resistance that we don't fully uh, understand. Now, one of the things that's very striking about the integration inhibitors is they're all available in fixed dose formulations. Uh, so beyond the fact that they're available, it's what's happened to tablet size. So if you start at the bottom, you see the Abacavir 3TC Dolutegravir tablet. <coughs> and if you go up to the top, you see the latest, the Bic Tegravir FTC and TAF the tenofovir alafinamide tablet. And this alone, I think, is a remarkable advance in drug delivery, that we can take three drugs, uh, we can give a total weight of 721 milligrams in a tablet as small as the Bictarvi, which is what it's commercially uh, known as. Um, I'm sure Dr. Tabas will talk about uh, you know, recommendations for the use of integration inhibitors. This comes from the Department of Health and Human Services table from the United States. All four of the integration inhibitors are now uh, among the regimens recommended for first-line therapy mm -hmm. in antiretroviral naive persons. <laughs> and a final comment, this uh, paper has just been published in Annals of Internal Medicine. It was presented as an abstract at CROI in 2017, but it looks at HIV viral suppression trends in the United States, some 31,000 uh, patients from 1997 through 2015. And what is striking first, if you look at the graph, um, how rates of viral suppression have improved from about 30% in 1997 to just up, upwards of 85% uh, in 2015. So th that alone uh, is really worth commenting. They then went on to look at covariates that were associated with the odds um, for uh, detectable viral load and found that integrase inhibitor use uh, decreased the odds quite significantly for having a detectable viral load. So this switch, Dr. Shapiro has alluded to it, I'm sure it will come up in Dr. Tabas's talk, this switch to using integrase inhibitors seems to have a strong association, at least in the United States, with increasing rates of viral suppression. So now if we take all of these data together, these fixed dose combinations, very small tablet size, clinical data showing improving trends in viral suppression, why do we need better drug delivery techniques? What we have is really very good, safe, well-tolerated regimens. And, and I'll tell you that's indeed the case. Well, I, I think the, the rationale to think about other delivery forms could actually be found in this slide. This is from, at least the top part of it, is from promotional literature for the antipsychotic drug paliperidone. This drug is available in oral tablets in a once monthly extended release uh, injectable formulation and in an every three months uh, injectable extended release formulation. So what it offers to clinicians is the ability to stabilize a patient on the oral tablets the dose often ranges between 3 to 12 milligrams per day. And once clinical efficacy has been established and uh, tolerability has been established, you can then move to a once monthly injection. If that uh, continues all to go well, then you can move to an every three month uh, injection of this drug. Is it appropriate for all patients? No, probably not. But for those who it is, it offers convenience, uh, it decreases the pill taking fatigue. Uh, so a lot of advantages for certain individuals to go to um, these long uh, extended release uh, injectable uh, products. So let me then talk about uh, some of the emerging technology for drug delivery as it's applied to antiretroviral drugs. We have agents that are being uh, studied for long-acting depot injections. We have uh, microneedle drug patches. There are some novel oral uh, <coughs> formulations, wearable infusion pumps, vaginal rings, and subdermal impa implants, to just mention a few. 
that I think are really going to show then some promise uh, in new ways to administer antiretroviral drugs. First, a few words about the characteristics of a drug that would be suitable for some of these formulations. They won't work for every drug that's out there. In general, we need to be able to give, the drug needs to be potent enough that we can give it in a very low dose. It needs to have at least a medium to a long half-life, so something 12 hours or more. And the therapeutic concentrations in must be very low. Remember, we're going to have to load some device with enough drug to last for a month or to last for three months. So the drug has to be potent enough then that how much drug we need to put in the device becomes low in itself. And you see that, for example, in this table I'm showing at the bottom of some drugs we're currently studying for injectable delivery. We'll talk a bit about cabotegravir. Again, it, it, ta it takes a low daily dose, 30 milligrams once a day. It has a good intermediate half-life of four hours and low uh, concentrations that are associated with therapeutic effect. Well, I'm going to spend then my time talking with you about four uh, drug delivery options for uh, antiretroviral drugs. First, I'll say a few things about long-acting injectables, then move on to a few comments about implantable devices, some long-acting oral products, and end with uh, vaginal rings. Well, we are now in the era of uh, long-acting uh, injectables uh, in advanced stages of investigation for the treatment of HIV, treatment or uh, perhaps prevention of HIV. Cabotegravir and ropivirine is the combination that has been the longest studied. Uh, this paper that I'm showing published in Lancet uh, in uh, 2017 and really demonstrated um, from either once monthly injections of these long-acting formulations of cabotegravir or ropivirine or every eight-week uh, injections that you can maintain concentrations of these drugs within a fairly, fairly narrow range for a prolonged uh, period of time. And in doing so, um, this was associated, again, this is still from the same Lancet, Lancet publication, with a high degree of uh, therapeutic success when given for maintenance therapy. As you go through this paper, uh, and it's commented uh, in the paper, there may be uh, you know, small numbers, but may, may be some differences between uh, the every four-week administration and the every eight-week administration. There was no patient, uh, or I'll say it the other way, all patients uh, had a virologic response with every four weeks administration. That didn't happen with every eight weeks, and that's been the argument advanced so far for the four-week uh, uh, inject injectable study to move forward. But I will tell you that the every eight week uh, is not disbanded, uh, discarded at all. That is being uh, continued to be studied uh, as well. I think important uh, from this study was how patients felt about taking injectable, uh, 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 receiving these injectable formulations, and whether they got it every four weeks or received it every eight weeks, really very high rates of patient preference uh, for uh, this uh, injectable form of antiretroviral therapy. So this era is now with us. There are two uh, pivotal studies that uh, should be the final phase three studies that should lead to licensure. While nothing has been published yet, there was a preliminary news release uh, from uh, early this month about one of those studies uh, indicating uh, it, it, its efficacy was looking very good, so we'll expect to have more results probably before the end of this year, uh, I think, uh, on those. But all indications would appear right now that these products are headed towards at least approval by the Food and Drug Administration uh, in the United States. So a new era is going to be uh, upon us. So among the long-acting injectables, um, one uh, I do want to comment uh, has been a nanosuspension of four uh, antiretrovirals. And this has been developed to target tissues. Dr. Shapiro has talked about the importance 
uh, or potential importance of the, of the lymph nodes. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, a reservoir, we know it's a reservoir for the virus. Uh, as we have looked at drug concentrations in this reservoir for the agents we've studied, they tend to be very low. And so do we need to do something to more target this reservoir? In many ways, this may not be any different, for example, than the CSF. We know some drugs get in well to cerebral spinal fluid, some drugs don't get in as well, and it might be important in certain patients that we target drug delivery to the CSF. This product uh, has been developed by uh, a group of investigators at the University of Washington, and if you just look at what I circled uh, in the red, I'm highlighting here then the lymph node uh, to the concentrations in lymph node mononuclear cells to peripheral blood mononuclear cells and uh, out at uh, 192 hours after just a single dose, um, very, very high concentrations uh, of these drugs can be achieved by this nano suspension. So, um, a possibility here, if we need to target certain areas of the body, certain compartments of the body, these long-acting injectable products, they have to be engineered for this. So it's not just necessarily going to happen with a long-acting injectable, uh, but, with, uh, but if they're engineered to get to a certain uh, um, area of the body, it may be a strategy for us to deliver high concentrations of drugs there. <clears throat> Let me move to the second one and say a few words about uh, implantable devices. Of course, for those of you that uh, either work in or familiar with the contraceptive area, you'll know in that uh, area we've been using implantable devices for a long uh, period of time, and they're regarding, regarded as one of the very uh, common ways uh, to achieve uh, contraceptive, contraceptive efficacy for three out to five years for some of these devices. This is a subdermal implant of the tenofovir uh, alfenamide. Well, you can't tell from the schematic at the top, it is about the size of one of the oral, excuse me, one of the implantable uh, contra, you know, uh, contraceptives. And uh, at, at this point has just really, has not gone into humans, uh, has just been studied in animals, but can deliver this drug for over a 40 day uh, period of time maintaining very high concentrations both in plasma as well as inside the cell of the active uh, ingredients of tenofovir. So really it's just a feasibility demonstration, but I think an important one, particularly for nucleosides, because these are the drugs that have been notoriously difficult to try to put into whether it be a long-acting suspension uh, or, or devices because of their physical chemical properties. So this is an important, I think, feasibility uh, demonstration. Now a second one, this is uh, an investigational drug, EFDA. It's being developed by Merck. It is a nucleoside uh, type of drug an extremely potent uh, uh, agent. In fact, it may well be one of the most, if not the most potent, of the nucleosides for anti-HIV that, that we have seen. It has um, properties that look to be attractive to try to put this into an implant that has been done and studied in a rat, in the rat model, and again found it can maintain extremely high concentrations, both in plasma, this drug has to get inside of cells and be phosphorylated, just like all nucleosides do, and maintain high intracellular concentrations, uh, such that you know potentially this could be a, you know a, um, an every six month uh, type of device. So again, uh, a long ways to go, but an important demonstration of what can be possible for some of the nucleoside drugs. Now third, I want to say something about long-acting uh, oral products. And here, for individuals at work, uh, of you that work in pediatrics, you know there's some striking differences between the availability of fixed dosage forms for children and adolescents and fixed dosage forms available for adults. So here I've taken from the DHHS guidelines in the United States for preferred regimens from infants uh, out to adolescents, what that regimen is, and then just added yes or no, whether there is a fixed dose combination or not, and you'll see it's mostly all no's, there is not. So there is a real need 
to bring drug uh, delivery technology down into pediatrics so that they can have some of the benefits of these fixed dosage forms uh, as uh, these single tablet once daily forms as do adults. Now one of the things that has been a challenge in children has been to take these drugs, lopinavir, rotonavir is one of several examples that are just very poorly soluble. So we've had to combine them with things such as ethanol, with things such as propylene glycol, uh, if we want to get them into solution form to be able to give to the youngest of children. And there are very uh, potential uh, concerns, serious concerns about giving either ethylene uh, or ethanol or propylene glycol uh, to children. So these investigators from the University of Liverpool then have applied nanoformulation technology to remove the ethanol, to remove the propylene glycol, and develop now an oral, it's a spray dried uh, nanoparticle. Uh, this bottom uh, two graphs uh, show you on the left what uh, the concentrations in this case of lopinavir look like with the conventional uh, formulation that would have the ethanol, the propylene glycol, and on the right um, with this spray dried nanoparticle. And if you look at the solid uh, black line indicating the median mean concentrations, really they've been able to achieve very similar types uh, of concentrations. <coughs> now this is in rats, so still a ways to go, but they have now uh, received approval to do at least the uh, first dose uh, studies uh, in humans. So a technology that's moving forward that then would have the ability, uh, you know, if it, if it all works out, uh, to be able to look at some new fixed dose uh, dosage forms uh, in children. Uh, Afavarins uh, uh, has some similar uh, challenges when it comes uh, to, you know, to formulating. Uh, it's the same investigators from the University of Liverpool now that in this case have looked at new nanoparticle formulations of, of afavarins to be able to achieve the same concentrations that we would get in adults if you take the standard 600 milligram dose by only giving half that amount. So using these novel nano formulations to improve the oral bioavailability. In simple terms, that's really what's going, you know, what's going on here. Um, they have now uh, been able to study this uh, compound uh, in adults and found indeed that they can give a 50% reduced dose but achieve the same concentration. So both of these types of uh, oral uh, technology, I think, have the ability for us to tackle some of the lack of fixed dose formulations uh, for, for children and then be able to develop some novel ones, uh, particularly in the generic uh, marketplace that a pharmaceutical company might not otherwise uh, develop. Well, I'm going to end the oral part with what I think is one of the you know, coolest, if you will, representations of some of the technology, some of the thinking that's going on out there. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see this device. Uh, it looks like a star of sorts with, three, with uh, six different arms sticking out of it. And then what the, you know, a cross-section, what the makeup of this is. But you can begin to imagine what the potential of such a device is. You could load it with drugs to, you know, to release at certain periods of time, and you see a schematic representation of that at the bottom. So you could give an initial burst and then uh, have slower maintenance uh, dose type of release. How you could combine different drugs uh, you know, together and uh, you know, get the release profiles uh, that you want. And the, the plot on the far right is just a schematic representation uh, of doing that. But this device now has been studied uh, in uh, vivo in the swine model, which actually for oral absorption is a very good model uh, for mimicking what will happen, uh, what will happen in humans. Um, in the red circle is actually the, you know, this device now, uh, you know, uh, swallowed uh, orally by, you know, by a pig. And in this case, they were looking at the integrase inhibitor dolutegravir and showing both the ability of this device to give you an immediate release as well as to achieve a sustained release uh, over time with dolutegravir. They included other drugs in this device as well. I just uh, took the plot for dolutegravir to simply illustrate the 
some of the promise of what such a device uh, has been. Um, so a long way to go. One of the challenges with these devices really becomes the engineering of them. Uh, from a regulatory point of view, and I'll, I'll probably make this point again, these type of th um, products would have to be regulated not only as a drug, but they would have to be regulated as a device as well. And so the, there's some challenges there in getting, uh, in getting them on the market. Well, the final, then I'll end with just a quick uh, comment on the vaginal ring. Uh, and here, what's important? Okay, um, I think what's exciting about this product is it's being developed both for the prevention of HIV as well as for contraception. So a um, representation of what this product looks like in the upper left-hand corner. And the two drugs they've studied uh, have been depivirine, uh, which has been shown uh, in clinical studies to have a, uh, an ability to prevent HIV infection um, with uh, levonorgestrel for <coughs> prevention of, con of contraception. So what's really emerging uh, in, the, in this uh, era is then dual purpose uh, uh, devices. So, uh, and for PrEP, then it's really both prevention of HIV and for uh, contraception. So let me move to the last part and uh, a few closing comments. So as I mentioned, long, we know now long acting injectables work. So the cabotegravir, rilpivirine data that we have today, uh, I think has a, you know, made a clear demonstration of that, that you can administer them every four weeks, you can administer them every eight weeks, they were safe, they were, you know, they were effective, and patients reported a high degree of uh, preference for these uh, types of uh, drug delivery strategies. But now what? Um, so here is a partial list, I think, of some of the questions and as a field that we will have to address. What are going to be the best candidates uh, of drugs to be delivered in this way? What about children and adolescents and pregnant women? Uh, oral lead-ins, do you need to give an oral lead-in to ensure tolerance and safety? Uh, and, and if so, for how long? Um, What's the, uh, you know, the optimal dose? Can inject invo injection volumes be reduced? They're fairly large uh, um, right now. How do you manage toxicities? Short term, long term? What about drug interactions? What happens if you're supposed to get it every month and you miss a dose? So what does, you know, uh, how, you know uh, how does that affect uh, res you know, the potential of resistance? How do you stop it? If you have to manage that PK tail, as we've learned uh, um, from uh, you know, uh, giving drugs to you know, pregnant women, how do you do that now when you've got something that lasts uh, so long uh, in the body? All manageable challenges, I think, but we, we can't be naive about um, some of the challenges that we're going to uh, have to come up with answers for. There are some advantages and disadvantages, I think, of whether we go the injectable route versus the implant route. This is a very nice paper that was published just earlier this year by uh, Charles Flexner at Johns Hopkins. A couple of them, the injectables, I think, have a real advantage uh, over removal, whether it's just removing it at the end of treatment or if, or if therapy is not being tolerated, you can go in, remove, uh, remove the implant, and the effect of the drug clears out very, you know, very well. An injectable, you can't, uh, you obviously can't do that. Um, um, for uh, potential disadvantages uh, of, the inject of the implants uh, or the injectables, I'd already mentioned the regulatory challenge, both uh, a device as well as a drug. It does require a surgical procedure uh, to, uh, you know, to remove it if you, if you, need, to, if you need to do that. Um, when we think about using these devices for generics, uh, the implants probably present more of challenges than the injectables would uh, in that case. 
Um, and then to end, um, I, I think uh, there are some real opportunities here with these new drug delivery strategies. Among the long-acting uh, injectables that we've, you know, that we've talked about, we have the ability right now we can see to achieve once a month, um, maybe out to every three months uh, of, of drug delivery. And for certain uh, individuals uh, taking antiretroviral drugs, I think this could be a real advantage for them. We talked a little bit about target delivery. Um, if we need to get drug into lymphoid tissues, uh, if we need to get drug in the cerebral spinal fluid, if there's other reservoirs that become important, um, nano formulations. Uh, in fact, this is one of the original motivations actually to develop nano formulations is there because of their ability to be engineered to get into uh, otherwise hard to reach target spaces. New drugs, new drugs are always going to be welcome, I, I think, in the uh, HIV area. Some of these new drugs are highly potent and r really are going to open up additional opportunities for co-formulations and being put in some uh, devices uh, uh, that we don't, uh, that we would not have right now. And finally, as I've said a few words about pediatrics, I think what we're going to learn from these types uh, of drug delivery uh, ap approaches can be applied uh, to pediatrics to try to prevent uh, uh, provide uh, new combinations uh, for uh, children and adolescents. And with that, uh, I would like to say thank you. It's just uh, been a real delight for me to be here, and uh, I'll try to tackle any questions except ones from Dr. Shapiro. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>